Hello and welcome to Showcase. We're looking at machines that dream, Rembrandt's light, and a loving tale about divorce. Did you dye your hair again? No, this is me. You don't like it? Is it shorter? I prefer it longer, but... The Netflix drama Marriage Story puts you in the middle of a relationship that's falling apart. AI and humans unite to make machines dream. And a London gallery thinks Rembrandt would be a filmmaker if he was alive today. Marriage Story. The name's ironic because it's a movie about divorce. But perhaps not just any divorce, but one that was partly inspired by the breakup of Noah Baumbach, the film's director. So, brush aside those holiday classics for just one second and make room on your Netflix queue for a more nuanced drama. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. What I love about Charlie, he loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. It's wife versus husband. L.A. versus New York. But strangely, in this bout against two quarreling spouses, there's no clear winner or a loser. Nicole and Charlie's relationship is falling apart. The couple live in New York, work at the theater where she's a leading actress and he's a director. When Nicole feels dissatisfied with their marriage, she goes back home to Los Angeles. They both want an amicable breakup. But when it comes to the custody of their eight-year-old son, the gloves come off. Lawyers get involved. And the film's director says Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver gave a very convincing portrayal of a very dirty process. There are a lot of, there are a lot of challenging scenes in this movie for all of us, really. And they gave so much of themselves to it. it was, I, I feel like, often I felt like I was watching their movie because of what they were revealing in the characters. And, and they really... Uh, we're kind of fearless, and, and, and that was, that's so gratifying as a director. If you think director Noah Baumbach used his own real-life divorce from actor Jennifer Jason Lee as inspiration, well, there was a lot more to it than that. You know, I, I did a lot of research, and I talked to couples, both the men and women who had been through divorce. I talked to couples who've stayed together because I kind of wanted to just hear everything. I wanted to hear about relationships in general and what lasts and what hasn't and why. And I talked to the professionals, lawyers, uh, uh, judges, because I, I, it, 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 I saw it as an opportunity to kind of tell, uh, you know, a, 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 an expansive story about the subject. I'll never get to really be his parent again. He needs to know that I fought for him. Divorce is a tumultuous theme throughout many of Bambach's films. But many critics say marriage story is different, that there are small moments that make you feel sad, joyful, and pleased. And the most unique for Bambak, it's ultimately what some say, it's a feel-good story, with The Independent calling it a breakup film for the millennial era. Eventually, it'll be the two of you having to figure this out. Together. Film critic Kaylee Donaldson joins me. Hi, Kaylee. So a lot of people are saying that uh, this is a feel-good story, but actually, I it, it wasn't my experience. So I wonder what you have to say about it. Is it a feel-good story? Feel-good feels like uh, exaggeration. It's certainly an emotional experience. I cried a little bit during it. I had friends who absolutely sobbed their hearts out during it. It's This is something that Noah Baumbach has a specialty in. He loves to dig deep into the recesses of human emotions and especially the tricky areas where there are really no right or wrong answers. And I think this is the best example of that that he's ever done. This is a very tricky emotional thing to dig into, divorce and the end of a marriage. And I think that he is pulling off something really special here, especially as someone who typically is quite distant from his work. I tend to find him a little too dry, but here it was all emotion all the time. But I mean, in a modern sense, I think Charlie and Nicole, the characters, sort of got a, a, a Hollywood ending, didn't they? I can see that case. I think that a problem with doing 
divorce movies in Hollywood anyway is that people really want to make stories about good people versus bad people. It's, you know, there's always the, the, the one evil spouse and the one perfect angel one. And this one isn't really about that. Both of them, you could say, are in the right and in the wrong about this divorce. They both have good intentions at heart and have made bad decisions. And I think that's more realistic as to what the end of a marriage is like. It's not usually dramatic screaming in a courtroom while people laugh. It is really this being put through the ringer and having your entire life be put on display by lawyers who are being paid an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, of course, I mean, the director says that he got a lot from his own divorce when uh, making this movie. So we know that the character is partially based on him, but do you find him biased in that sense? It's an interesting one because I do think he has tried very, very hard to make this quite even, to not have someone get more of the narrative than the other. But I think this is something where his bias and his own history comes into play. Because in my opinion, Charlie, the character played by Adam Driver, who is very bound back in places, does get a little more of that kind of sympathetic light. That's not to say that Nicole, the Scarlett Johansson character, is portrayed as a baddie. He's clearly trying to understand her situation and be sympathetic to it. But there are these big emotional moments, like the massive blowout argument they had. He's clearly on Charlie's side, in my opinion. And I think that's something that may uh, bug some people who watch the film. Ultimately, I think that it pays off in a way that makes sense. But I think it's also hard to not watch this film and start to play armchair psychologist as to how much Scarlett Johansson is based on Jennifer Jason Lee. <laughs> and I mean, uh, speaking of Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver, I mean, I think they are sort of like two extraordinary, let me say, in their careers to be that relatable to the audience, I think. What do you think about their performances? Do you think they're doing uh, a good job in being relatable? Oh, yeah. I mean, I understand why people think that these are the best performances these actors have given. I actually think Scarlett Johansson's best performance this year is in Jojo Rabbit, but I am in the vast minority with that one. Uh, but these two are mega stars. They're Marvel and Star Wars actors. They are known the world over. So to have them be really grounded in this way is a testament to how talented they are. I think Adam Driver is probably the front runner for Best Actor at the Oscars this year, unless the, um, the Academy voters just really like Joker and want to go for Joaquin Phoenix instead. Um, but he's someone who has put in the work for many years as an indie darling, and I think that this would pay off for him. Same for Johansson. It's really um, a testament to how much Baumbach is an actor's director. He loves to give them these really meaty but very grounded monologues. It's famously, there is not a moment of improv in this movie. They stick to the, you know, the full stop with every single decision here. That's definitely going to be interesting, Katie Donaldson. Good to have you on our show today. Thank you. If machines could dream, what would it look like? That's one of the questions about artificial intelligence that Turkish artist Refik Anadol explores in a new installation in Berlin called Blatant Being. TRT World's Irish Pizza has more. These images are generated by a computer. It combs through millions of pictures, analyzing the surrounding environment to produce something its creator likens to a machine dream. So latent being is kind of almost three years long, like ideation of how a machine can become a collaborator to create a narrative. It's a site-specific installation at a former power plant turned event space in Berlin. Organized into four chapters, it allows visitors to see how artificial intelligence, or AI, works in real time. The final chapter is where you can see how the computer is streaming and develops a consciousness about its surrounding the space and eventually Berlin. Latent Being is the work of Rafik Anadol, an artist from Istanbul, now based in Los Angeles, where he and his team use some of the newest AI software tools on the planet. Their work is rooted at the intersection of art and technology. Latent Being's third chapter incorporates the movements of the installation's visitors into its output. As we all know, the machines that we everyday use has capacity of like knowing who we are, where we are going, what we are eating, what we are seeing. Pretty much we are tracked by machines and softwares and algorithms. And that chapter is basically speculating a future where AI can extract data from us and use it as its dream processes. The Berlin-based organization Light Art Space works with artists like Anadol 
whose work features science or technology. We believe that art gains a certain relevance, that we live in very challenging times. There's a lot happening, there's new technologies coming up. Artificial intelligence is turning our lives over and changing our lives. And a lot of people have no understanding or no access to these new technologies. While some are uneasy about how AI is changing the world, Anadol says he believes optimism may help steer that process in the right direction. It's pretty positive actually, saying maybe we can use these machines and these ideations to create less fears and more hopeful iterations. For example, can we learn better? Can we look at our memories different? Like, can we remember with machines? Can we apply this logic to a space that can have a capacity of remembering or even dream? To end it all, that space, created by AI, remains a vast frontier. But eventually there is no way that you can understand truly what that space holds. So I think the more creator mi creative minds will try to learn more about this black box or an infinite space to give a sense of like meaning. And eventually that question will lead to a more and more creative outputs. Conceptually, it may be a lot to take in, but Leighton Being's four chapters unfold in around half an hour. And since the AI brain operates in real time, no two performances are the same. Visitors can experience Leighton Being here through the fifth of next month. And another of Anadol's AI-driven installations called Machine Hallucination can be found at New York City's Chelsea Market through January. Ira Spitzer, TRT World, Berlin. Rembrandt is a storyteller through light and shade. He used it to capture ordinary people with all their imperfections. His methods are almost impossible to replicate, but one London gallery is attempting to do just that through extraordinary means. As the year of Rembrandt comes to a close, Hatija Maryam Gallagher takes one more look at the master Dutch painter. Inside the halls of the oldest public art gallery in England is a tribute to Rembrandt's use of light. London's Dulwich Picture Gallery honors the master of light and shadow with a seminal exhibition as part of the Year of Rembrandt celebrations, focusing on the period when he was at the peak of his career. Everybody always says Rembrandt, 17th century Dutch painter, master of light. And we wanted to ask, how? How was he a master of light? And we addressed that theme through the rooms of the exhibition by setting a different mood in each room. The curators have played around with the idea that Rembrandt could have been a filmmaker rather than a painter if he was alive today, because of his fascination with light. To achieve this unique vision, the gallery invited leading cinematographer Peter Shishitsky, known for his work on Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The labels for each painting begin with a description as though the artwork was a film, a film script. And so we describe what's happening in the paintings, the etchings and the drawings as though setting up a scene within a film. The first room is all about the influence of theatre and drama on Rembrandt's work and his sophisticated control of light to convey motion and emotion. The denial of St. Peter tells the biblical story with a touch of theatrical light. Rembrandt tells this story in different phases through a different approach to light. The bright light in the centre, the firelight in the bottom right, and then the shadowy silhouettes of the figures in the top right-hand corner. He takes us on a journey of different moods. He is able in one painting to do what a filmmaker would take two and a half hours to describe. Rembrandt didn't write very much about his work. So, to learn more about how the artist manipulated light within his studio, curators actually recreated a part of his room, inspired by the drawing, The Artist's Studio. In the window setup, 
Rembrandt would pull a linen above the window so that light could bounce off that onto a model position below. He would shut the shutters on the bottom half of the window and we have accounts that he would use oiled cloths or blackout blinds that he would position across the glass on the windows to stream light through, manipulating light, encouraging these effects of light to create really evocative and emotional works of art. Perhaps the real star of the show is one from the gallery's own collection, Girl at a Window. The curator calls it the Mona Lisa of London. And it's easy to see why when you look into her eyes. And within the painting, Rembrandt uses a trompe l'oeil technique, which means that the figure seems to lean, to lean out of the painting. It has an illusionistic effect and she has a wealth of blackness behind her, a darkness from which she emerges. And so to draw out this effect, we have hung the painting on a strip of the world's blackest black paint. This is a paint called Black 3.0, developed by the artist Stuart Semple. And the idea with this paint is that it absorbs 99% of all light. So then we have lit the painting very carefully so that the effect is as if the girl at a window hovers in space. So in the end, it was ordinary people depicted in a unique, sophisticated light that made Rembrandt a visionary in the 17th century. Rembrandt painted us as human beings as we are. Hatice Meryem Gelgör, TRT World, London. While the almost nine-year war in Syria continues, so does the struggle for the millions who fled the country. There are many stories to be told, and we head to Geneva, where a group of Syrian artists are showcasing their works about their emotional journey. Life goes on, art goes on. That's the name of this exhibition taking place at the United Nations office in Geneva. features 14 oil paintings and photographs by Syrian artists who are now living in Turkey. You will find many refugees here, uh, which reflects the feelings of the refugees, uh, and arts uh, is an important part of that. The exhibition is co-hosted by the Turkish Presidency as part of the Global Refugee Forum, an event that gathered world leaders, including Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Turkey hosts the largest number of refugees in the world, and Imad Habbab, one of the featured portraiture artists, is one of them. He believes, regardless of their identity as refugees, people should first be valued as human beings. It's a lesson told throughout his work, that even though he and his fellow painters have been through death and destruction, they continue to survive through the healing power of art. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You is at the top of the Billboard Hot 100, even though it's 25 years old. It's the first time a holiday hit has topped the chart since 1959. The Hot 100 looks at all radio play, streaming and sales in the United States. College with Ainsley too. I always thought of Ainsley, Duffy and Craig as more of a trio. No, there are always four of us. Another 90s comeback is the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral. American comedian and writer Mindy Kaling adapts the romantic comedy to the small screen keeping the gist of the plot, which involves enough chills, a goodbye, and the highs and lows of falling in love. Artist Simone Fugazotto is under fire for allegedly fueling racism against black footballers in Italy. The artist's paintings of chimpanzees were used by Italy's Serie A football league in a campaign against racist chants. But a firestorm of criticism has been leveled against the white artist with critics saying his paintings only perpetuate stereotypes. 
because Otto defended his work, saying true art is provocation. There aren't many pieces of art that have survived the drama the Ghent altarpiece has weathered. Calvinists wanted to destroy it. Napoleon and Hitler stole it. But it survived and now it's received a much needed restoration. In 1432, Jan van Eyck put the finishing touches on the large masterpiece he began with his brother years earlier. Today, the Gant altarpiece, also known as the Adoration of the Mystic Lamp, is considered one of the most coveted and desired pieces of artwork of the Western world. Just one thing, unlike the Mona Lisa or David, it's been falling apart. The altarpiece was burglarized a few times, most notably by Napoleon and later the Nazis who stored the entire work in a salt mine for most of the Second World War. The piece endured quite a lot of damage, so restoration work began in 2012. The lamp, like the rest of the painting, 50% of the central panel was repainted. So the lamp we had was not Van Eyck's 15th century lamp, except that in the 1950s there had already been a first treatment, but it had only lasted a year with only one person. We worked for three years with eight people, so you can see the difference. The restoration team used a special technique called scanning. They used x-rays to reveal what laid below the surface paint. The technique was never before executed on such a large surface, and it gave the lamp a new face. It now looks less like a lamp and more human. The removal of the repaints has totally changed the appearance of the lamp. He now has a physical presence and a gaze that ultimately appeals to the faithful, the spectator. Something we didn't see before. Another change. The previous lamp strangely had two sets of ears. When the treatment began, the lamp had four ears. The original ears and the overpainted ears, which had been preserved. So this grand masterpiece, which has survived dictators and environmental degradation, is once again on display in Belgium's St. Bavo Cathedral. Only now with a human-looking lamp with two ears. Back in the 1980s, Tom Hanks was America's critically acclaimed funny man. With the 1990s, came the high-concept roles that brought him Academy Awards. He then took parts that stepped away from the leading spotlight and the prize department. That is until now, as Hanks transforms himself into the man who wants to be your neighbor. Bauer. Alan Bauer has a very successful business. After paying his dues in low-budget filmmaking through a series of quirky roles, Tom Hanks attracted the attention of major movie studios who immediately branded him as the funny leading man of romantic comedies. Audiences accepted him as America's sweetheart, and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences found his performance in Big impressive enough to nominate him for Best Lead Actor. Can they pay you for that? How does it feel to be an All-American? With the 1990s, Hanks branched out as an actor and, in a bold move, switched from lighthearted comedies to epic dramas. He took home two Oscars back-to-back -back with his wins for Philadelphia and Forrest Gump. These blockbusters led to his hand at major motion picture franchises. Bonnie's toy. Pixar's Toy Story allowed the way for a pop cinema phase in Hanks's career. Huh? What? Oh, I ask you a hypothetical question. Recent years saw him move to high concept biopics, a move described by some fans to be motivated by Hanks's hunger for more Oscar glory. Not yet. Hey, I'm looking for Fred Rogers. In here. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful, a beautiful day in the neighborhood sees Hanks exploring biographical territory once again. 
this time, he assumes the role of Fred Rogers, the creator and presenter of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, an educational kids show which was syndicated for 31 seasons. In the movie, a jaded journalist draws a biographical sketch of Mr. Rogers. Critics say this investigative narrative device allows Hanks to balance his early American sweetheart persona with deeper shades of dramatic effect. We are trying to give the world positive ways of dealing with its feelings. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfere Ketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.